So, yeah, hi everyone. Um, so you heard a bit about Kubernetes. Um, now you're going to hear a bit about some other stuff called Platform SH, which is, um, well, let's go two, three steps back. Um, this is actually a talk that my colleague Robert Douglas wrote, and he was kind enough to just throw it in my lap. I managed to change the slide where it says who's giving the talk. Apart from that, it's Rob's talk. So if I sometimes look a bit confused about what I'm talking about, you know why. But um, in general, um, yeah, deployment, uh, developing and deploying on containers, that's something that you might think, okay, cool, that's Docker, that's Kubernetes, that's Docker Swarm, that's all that kind of stuff. We've heard of all that. Um, but there's other ways to do that as well. Um, uh, Platform SH was invented before Docker existed. So we use LXC, and uh, that means that we're kind of like the, the, the alternative or the opposite of Kubernetes in, in, in certain ways, which, you know, could be fun because uh, it's always great to be um, a, a, a lion in a den of Daniels, if you understand the uh, reference. Uh, so let's, so here goes. Um, uh, I just need to get the right, here we go, yeah, okay. Right. Um, my name's uh, Andrew Melk. Uh, I'm responsible for Platform SH in uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. And uh, you can get me on Twitter. I don't have any other social media, so don't try and find me on Facebook, <laughs> for example. Um, right. So when we talk about DevOps, there are like two different parts to that. There's application development and there's um, operations. And uh, uh, when we think about it that way, uh, you have um, a team doing application uh, development and they're writing code and the op uh, op ops engineers are making sure that you've got a robust and uh, scalable deployment. Um, what Platform SH does, or part of what Platform SH does, is to automate the handoff between those two parts and to really uh, simplify that. So the way it does that is it can actually help manage that handover for all the languages. Well, maybe not all of them, but a hell of a lot of them. And uh, that's one of the things that I'm going to show you a bit about how that works and, and how we can do that. So when you're thinking about uh, how to do that, you've got to think about deployment pipelines. And so take a moment to take a look at this diagram. But actually, I think we've actually got a, a better version and uh, as you can see this one actually gives you a bit more of an overview of how you're going to have a dev phase continuous integration testing and release but see if you can memorize it actually I've got an even better one here and this will really give you an idea about how to do this stuff as you can see it's pretty straightforward really so this will be easy, said nobody ever, yeah? And we know that. And when you're developing and deploying on containers um, with just a few lines of YAML, um, you're going to need some kind of uh, package manager, depending on what you're actually deploying. So, you know, for example, you're going to have um, a Gradle or Maven. If it's Java, you're going to have Composer with PHP. You're going to have, um, you know, like Ruby Gems. You're going to have NPM, those kind of things, Yarn, to deploy for those various kind of runtimes. And um, for some of those languages, you know, you might need to actually compile. Others are interpreted. And in most cases, you'll have a, a package manager. But back in the old days, of course, you know, like you always had a good excuse. You say, oh, it's compiling, it's compiling, boss. Everything's cool. Um, so the thing is, of course, then you've got different deployment strategies depending on, uh, you know, the particular type of uh, server or the particular type of runtime that you actually want to be deploying. So. Um, for example, with Java, you're going to have some kind of executable web server, perhaps, or, or rather an application server with Tomcat for, for multiple applications, or a built server like you'd have with, with Golang or Lisp, or maybe you'll have um, PHP FPM, or something like um, immutable microservices with uh, Payara or other kind of Java um, applications like that. And each of those is going to have its own nuances and needs, and as you can imagine, that means there's always quite a bit of complexity in that handover between the, 
development phase, the application development phase, and the, um, uh, the uh, deployment and uh, operations phase. So the way that we see, this is where I get stuck, you see. The unified workflow that we, that we use is basically using um, um, what we call Git ops. And um, by doing that, what you have is a single mechanism that moves stuff from the developer side to the operation side. And that mechanism is basically just Git push. Um, it's the border between development territory and operations territory. And um, to give the kind of developer-centric uh, GitOps experience you need, um, Git push has to be a mechanism through which all CI and CD deployment is done. And so that also means that the tools after your Git push have to be able to handle each of your languages individually. So that means when you do push, that environment, that infrastructure is going to be aware of whichever one of those runtimes you're actually um, using and how to actually deal with that and handle that in an appropriate way. And of course, also handling the um, configuration of the services that are needed once you've done that as well. So all of that orchestration for your databases, your indexes, mess message queues. So for example, if you're using Rabbit or something like that, and of course, all of the storage. So you need to have basically a system that can take everything from that initial developer Git push all the way through to instantiating all of those and connecting up all the services that you require. Sorry, and of course, make sure that all of that is actually code that is inside your Git repo side by side with your application code so that you can be sure that every single time you have um, a Git hash, that Git hash is actually going to define not just uh, your code for your application, but also for your infrastructure, which means you can always revert to a previous version of code plus infrastructure. So let's look at a couple of examples. And I'd be lying to say that I understand all of these entirely. Um, Lisp isn't really where I'm at right now, but um, I have been told that this is really the way you do it. And uh, what I love about this is the names that they have for these things. So ASDF, it's the only manager that actually you can just use by running your fingers across a keyboard. Um, and the uh, web server is really called Hunch and Toot. Just let that roll off your tongue. Do you want a bit of Hunch and Toot? Because it's pretty awesome. And uh, this is the way that you can actually just get a Lisp application running on Platform SH. That's all you need to do it. With Java, of course, there's a bit more that you need to do, but still, it's not particularly complex. So you have your POM XML. That'll compile the actual run, the run, runnable code as byte code. And then you uh, have your Tomcat or Payara, for example. And then you just start that web server. And as you can see, there's really very little code in there. It's 13 lines, but the actual code that you need is like it's four or five lines altogether to actually get something, get a Java application running on Platform SH. With Elixir, um, it's also a pretty straightforward operation, as you'll see from the actual amount of code that's, need that, that's needed there for a straightforward application. That'll define everything pretty much that you'll need. With .NET, a similar kind of situation, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven lines. And so, as you can see, we're already covering quite a bit of ground there. We haven't done any PHP or anything quite so normal as that here. But, you know, we might get to it. With Node, it's even more <laughs> simple. But of course, if you do want to have something like being able to actually incorporate versions, you'll need to actually have NPM or something like that as well to, to define that kind of stuff and do a bit more configuration. Um, as you can see here with uh, NVM, for example. 
And of course, the, uh, the benefits that you have there is that your coders are going to only code. You're going to have um, builds that are always consistent. All of your infrastructure is code. Um, you have Git push, which is a unified system, not just, but for, de not just for deployment, but for all of the other um, stuff that I've mentioned already. And of course, you've got a cross-team methodology and vocabulary. It simplifies onboarding and offboarding training across teams. So for example, in organizations, whether they're agencies or companies where you have a large uh, group of teams where perhaps they're also running, some people are doing Java, some people are doing PHP, some people are doing some other stuff, maybe .NET. Um, that means that you actually have a much more simplified approach to the way that you can do that kind of thing because everyone understands the kind of infrastructure that you're working on. And it also means that it's really straightforward to go in and take a template. These are just some of the templates that we offer. Um, I don't know what it is in total, but it's something around 50 different templates that we have right now, and that's something that's always expanding. Um, and uh, that means that you know, you've got a powerful kind of simplicity that allows you to uh, do more than just build applications and deploy them, but actually to run large amounts of applications efficiency, to add any kind of services you need, and uh, do that also on an enterprise level and with an, at an enterprise grade as well. And that's pretty much it. I hope I wasn't too long. Great. Thank you very much. If um, anyone, does anyone have a question or two? I might even be able to answer some of them. In a previous life, I was a solutions architect, so I can, I can lie as well. <laughs> Questions? Comments? Criticisms? <laughs> yeah, sure. In which way would you differentiate yourself from something like your own team, for example? I love that question. It's the only one I've got rehearsed. So, you know, in the old days when people used to say, so what is platform SH? And say, you know the way Heroku works? And people go, yeah. And so imagine if Heroku really worked. That's the way we do it. That's one way. But in the end, it's more to do with the fact that with Heroku, what you have is you have a whole set of services that you can choose. Those are provided by maybe different companies or different um, um, you know, like providers that will give you those services and you go and you buy your little service for Elastic, you buy your service for this, for that and everything. In Platform SH, it's, you know, um, it's the whole kahuna, you know, like, like in Pulp Fiction, right? You get everything. If you want an Elastic service, you just declare Elastic. If you want, um, you know, a Postgres, you just declare Postgres. All of that stuff runs inside a single, consistent, cluster which you completely control, which you can completely revert, where you don't owe anyone a cent on top of what you're actually uh, paying just for that particular provision. So for example, for um, a development environment, 10 euros a month, and you can do all of that yourself. I'd say that's the difference. It's basically completely revertible, reversible, completely under your control and completely orchestrated. Yeah. I'm so glad that I told you to ask that question. <laughs> okay. Next one. Marcel. Great.